A propos, I have often wondered what became of those nymphs later. In this wrought iron world of crisscross cause and effect, could it be that the hidden throb I stole from them did not affect their future? I had possessed her, and she never knew it, all right. But would it not tell sometime later? Had I not somehow tampered with her fate by involving her image in my voluptas? Oh, it was and remains a source of great and terrible wonder. I learned, however, what they looked like, those lovely, maddening, thin-armed nymphets, when they grew up. I remember walking along an animated street on a grey spring afternoon somewhere near the Madeleine. A short, slim girl passed me at a rapid, high-heeled, tripping step. We glanced back at the same moment, she stopped, and I accosted her. She came hardly up to my chest hair and had the kind of dimpled, round little face French girls so often have, and I liked her long lashes and tight-fitting tailored dress, sheathed in, in pale grey, her young body, which still retained, and that was the nymphic echo, the chill of delight, the leap in my loins, a childish something mingling with the professional frétillement of her small agile rump. I asked her price, and she promptly replied with melodious, melodious silvery precision, a bird, a very bird, sand. I tried to haggle, but she saw the awful long longing in my lowered eyes, directed so far down at her round forehead and rudimentary hat, a band, a posy, and with one bit of her lashes, tant pis, she said, and made as if to move away. Perhaps only three years later, sorry, perhaps only three years earlier, I might have seen her coming home from school. That evocation settled the matter. She led me up the usual step stairs, steep stairs, with the usual bell clearing the way for the monsieur who might not care to meet another monsieur. On the mournful claim, climb to the abject room, old bed and Bidet. As usual, she asked at once for her petit cadeau, and as usual I asked her name, Monique, and her age, 18. I was pretty well acquainted with the banal way of streetwalkers. They all answered, did sweet, a trim Twitter, a note of finality and wistful deceit, which they meet up to ten times per day, the poor little creatures. But in Monique's case, there could be no doubt she was, if anything, adding one or two years to her age. This I deducted from many details on her compact, neat, curiously immature body, having shed her clothes with fascinating rapidity. She stood for a moment partly wrapped in the dingy gauze of the window curtain, listening with infantile pleasure, as bad as bad could be, to an organ grinder in the dust-brimming courtyard below. When I examined her small hands and drew her attention to their grubby fingernails, she said with a naive frown, We, ce n'est pas bien, and went to the wash basin. But I said it did not matter, did not matter at all. With her brown bobbed hair, luminous grey eyes and pale skin, she looked perfectly charming. Her lips were no bigger than those of a squatting lad. In fact, I do not hesitate to say, and indeed this is the reason why I linger, linger gratefully in that ghost grey room of memory with little Monique, that among the eighty or so grues uh, I had had operate upon me, she was the only one that gave me a pang of genuine pleasure. Il était malin, celui qui a inventé ce trou-là she commented amiably, and got back into her clothes with the same high-style speed. I asked for another, more elaborate assignment later uh, the same evening, and she said she would meet me at the corner cafe at nine, and swore she had never poussé en lapin in all her young life. We returned to the same room, and I could not help saying how very pretty she was, to which she answered demurely, and then noticing what I noticed too in the mirror reflecting our small Eden, the dreadful grimace of clenched teeth tenderness that distorted my mouth. 
Dutiful little Monique, oh, she had been an infant all right, wanted to know if she should remove the layer of red from her lips avant qu'on se couche, in case I planned to kiss her. Of course, I planned it. I let myself go with her more completely than I had with any young lady before, and my last vision that night of long-lashed Monique is touched up with a gaiety that I find seldom associated with any event in my humiliating, sordid, taciturn love life. She looked tremendously pleased with the bonus of 50 I gave her as she trod out into the April night drizzle with Humbert Humbert lumbering in her narrow wake. Stopping before a window uh, display, she said with great gusto, Je vais m'acheter de bas. And never may I forget the way her Parisian childish lips exploded on bas, pronouncing it with an appetite that all but changed the A into a brief buoyant bursting O, as in but. I had a date with her next day at 2.15 p.m. in my own rooms, but it was less successful. She seemed to, to have grown less juvenile, more of a woman overnight, as cold as a, a cold I caught from her, led me to cancel a fourth assignment, nor was I sorry to break an emotional series that threatened to burden me with heart-rending fantasies and peter out in dull disappointment. So let her remain sleek, slender Monique, as she was for a minute or two, a delinquent nymph, shining through the matter-of-fact young whore. My brief acquaintance with her started a train of thought that may seem pretty obvious to the reader who knows the ropes. An advertisement in a lewd magazine landed me one brave day in the office of a Mademoiselle Edith, who began by offering me to choose a kindred style of from a collection of rather formal photographs in a rather soiled album, Regate Moi, c'est belle brune. When I pushed the album away and somehow managed to blurt out my criminal craving, she looked as if about to show me the door. However, after asking me what price I was prepared to disburse, she condescended to put me in touch with a person qui pourrait arranger la chose. Next day, Angus Matic woman, coarsely painted, garrulous, garlicky, with an almost farcical Provencal accent and a black moustache above a purple lip, took me to what was apparently her own domicile, and there, after explosively kissing the bunched tips of her fat fingers to signify the delectable rosebud quality of her merchandise, she theatrically drew aside a curtain to reveal what I judged was that part of the room where a large and unfastidious family usually slept. It was now empty safe for a monstrously plump, swallow, repulsively plain girl of at least fifteen with red ribbon thick black braids who sat on a chair perfunctorily nursing a bald doll a bold doll. When I shook my head and tried to shuffle out of the trap, the woman, talking fast, began removing the dingy woolen jersey from the young giantess torso. Then, seeing my determination to leave, she demanded son urgent. A door at the end of the room was opened, and two men who had been dining in the kitchen joined in the squabble. They were misshapen, bird-necked, very swarthy, and one of them wore dark glasses. A small boy and a begrimed, bowlage toddler lurked behind them. With the insolent logic of a nightmare, the enraged procurist, indicating the man in glasses, said he had served in the police, oui, so that I had better do as I was told. I went up to Marie, for that was her stellar name, who by then had quietly transferred her heavy haunches to a stool at the kitchen table and resumed her interrupted soup while the toddler picked up the doll. With a surge of pity, dramatizing my idiotic gesture, I thrust a banknote into her indifferent hand. She surrendered my gift to the ex-detective, whereupon I was suffered to leave. 